Welcome to the BioBee Chronicles, where we discuss the basics of beekeeping. I'm Natya Tanishvili, and I'm honored to start a new project and share the expertise of my grandmother, Venera Stepanishvili, a distinguished Georgian scientist, professor, academician of the Academy of Ecological Sciences, and a doctor of biological sciences, who left a significant body of work in the fields of biology and beekeeping. I'm starting the translation of her Georgian lectures into English so that people worldwide, whether they are hobbyists or aspiring scientists in the field, can benefit from her insights and by sharing her profound knowledge, we aim to ensure that the wealth of information she has imparted doesn't remain confined. Please keep in mind that English is not my first language, so if you ever have any suggestions regarding bee biology and apicultural terms, feel free to share them in the comments. Our first episode is a brief introductory tour into the fascinating world of beekeeping and the Georgian bee. The ones who are starting to engage themselves in this field, trust me, working with bees is going to be a fulfilling endeavor. The generous nature of these insects will make the experience highly enjoyable. Immersing yourself in the world of bees is not only certain to be captivating, but it can make a meaningful contribution to your family's budget. Let's talk about beekeeping by starting to explain of what beekeeping is. It is wrongly linked to the field of animal husbandry. It has been compared to and included in the same group. However, such an approach is fundamentally incorrect. Animal husbandry will never equate to beekeeping, and you might ask why. Because the bee creates seven different types of products and stores them. None of the fields of animal husbandry serve to store their products. Not a single animal species in this field of animal husbandry can thrive without humans. Any representative of animal husbandry, be it a cow, a camel, or a horse, is enlisted in the service of people, and none of them can survive without human intervention. Humans must provide them with food, water, establish appropriate sanitary hygienic conditions, and so on. Bees, on the other hand, need nothing of the sort from humans. They independently procure and manage all their necessities without human assistance. This is why beekeeping doesn't fall under the purview of animal husbandry. Now let's explain the use of the term of bee domestication. This term is also misleading as bees can't be domesticated in the traditional sense. Instead, beekeeping involves providing a habitat for them. Unlike domesticated horses or camels, bees operate in the same way in the wild as they do in the domestic settings. Beekeeping itself is a domestically built production that respects the instincts of these remarkable creatures. Attempting to change their behavior is misguided. Beekeeping as a production method is a domestic endeavor. It's crucial to acknowledge the role of bees' instincts and communicate with them accordingly. Beekeeping is not about re-educating bees. It is impossible to train or tame bees, but rather understanding and respecting their natural behaviors. Today's beekeeping, with its cultural significance, has evolved over a fascinating history. It began with the hunting of wild bees, extracting their products in primitive ways. The shift to contemporary beekeeping involved significant inventions like the frame comb, bee brace, and tools for handling beehives. Actually, the appearance of humans occurred later than that of bees in the world. During the era when bee hunting prevailed globally, Similar practices were observed worldwide. The hunter would break the bee's honeycomb or submerge the entire hive in water to annihilate the bees. Then with a shovel-like spoon, the hunter would extract honey along with bee larvae, propolis, royal jelly, and other bee products. This concoction referred to as comp composition. Why composition instead of honey? Because it was squeezed out and consumed, representing a blend of various ingredients, including honey. In our current era, as we transitioned into the cultural heritage period, tools like the big brace and honey strainers were invented to separate honey from imp impurities. These innovations protect the combs, allowing them to be reused for reproduction and ensuring the consumption of pure honey. Modern beekeepers now receive honey in its pure form. Beekeeping is often associated with honey, but it's essential to recognize that bees provide seven distinct products, honey, propolis, royal jelly, bee bread, beeswax, bee pollen, and bee venom. 
No other field of animal husbandry offers such diverse products. Furthermore, there is no animal husbandry industry that produces products consumable without additional processing. Bee products are prepared by bees and require no artificial or technological reprocessing. These products enter the body directly and are 100% fully digestible. Bees with, with their remarkable abilities produce and provide these valuable products. Now I want to share very interesting facts about the Georgian bee. Since ancient times, people across all continents have interacted with bees and Georgia is no exception. The tradition of beekeeping has been deeply ingrained in the Georgian culture throughout history. While some countries have excelled in developing advanced beekeeping practices, unfortunately our nation has faced challenges in this regard. However, it's essential to recognize that our ecological conditions and environment differ significantly from those in other regions. The unique climatic conditions in our country contribute to the exceptional nutritional value and healing properties of the Georgian bee products. As beekeeping evolved in the late 18th century, pivotal inventions like the frame comb, bee brace, and pine cone making tools spurred its progress. Examining today's cultural heritage reveals a significant historical journey, emphasizing the vital role of progressive measures in beekeeping's development. Undoubtedly, the Georgian bee stands as the most famous and recognized bee globally, securing the top position in the world. Previously, the Italian bee held the prestigious first place for its high productivity. However, during a world exhibition, the samples presented from Georgia surpassed the Italian bee, marking a shift in the global ranking. This isn't to diminish the qualities of Italian bees, rather it emphasizes the exceptional productivity of Georgian bees, making them highly sought after and in great demand. Historically, Georgian hosted seven bee breeding farms dedicated to the world's most recognized bee, known for its distinctive features. Let's delve into the story and uncover the unique characteristics that captivated the attention of the entire world. Primarily known as the Caucasian bee throughout history, the term Caucasian bee wasn't chosen to avoid a Georgian identity but originated from a period when the bee was studied and spread across the region known as the Caucasus. At that time, neither Georgia, Armenia, nor Azerbaijan existed as separate countries. The region was referred to as the Caucasus. As the positive characteristics of the bee were discovered in this region, it was documented in history books and zoology catalogues as the Caucas Caucasian bee. Following Georgia's independence, the bee rightfully regained its identity and name, and it, it is called the Georgian bee, the Georgian grey bee encompassing its true origins as the Caucasian, Abkhazian, Mingrelian, Svanetian, and Emiratian bees, all integral parts of Georgia. The term grey bee reflects the geographical and climatic influences, particularly in the areas where bees developed longer proboscises. The length of the proboscis was a result of adaptation to extract nectar from deeply placed nectarines. Notably, a longer proboscis didn't define the bee's Georgian nature, it simply showcased adaptation to specific climatic conditions. Much like the lengthening of a giraffe's neck for accessing food, the Abkhazian and Mangralian bees developed longer proboscises due to the deeper placement of nectarines in their habitats. The bees that adapted and descended from their slopes no longer needing extended proboscises are equally Georgian. In a sense, the color of skin changes with different climatic conditions, much like the adaptation of Georgian bees to diverse habitats, showcasing the remarkable influence of nature on these industrious insects. It extends beyond mere color. In the course of our selective work, a researcher came forward acknowledging a pivotal research finding. This revelation underscores that coloration isn't a decisive factor in determining a bee's breed. Instead, it is intricately tied to natural and climatic conditions, exerting its influence on coloration. As a result, it doesn't impede the formation of a breed. Now the term breed, it is used here as a conditional concept. Typically, a breed is something deliberately produced by human intervention. However, 
When referring to Georgian bees as a breed, it becomes a conditional concept borrowing from technical terminology. The term breed is inappropriate in this case as it de denotes a type of bee created solely by nature. Hence, we conditionally categorize it as a primitive breed. Now, what exactly does the term primitive breed signify? It indicates that human involvement was absent in this creation and formation. It is solely a product of nature, making it more accurately described as a species. And in the case of Georgian bee, it is the one species but various populations hailing from distinct regions such as Semegrelo, Guria, Imereti, Acheti, and Kartli. Which means that each population has adapted to the specific climatic conditions of its respective zone. Entomologists estimate the global insect population to exceed 2 million, yet only one species holds the title of honey-producing bee. This singular species, unlike the others, possesses the remarkable ability to contribute to honey production. Mastering the intricacies of this industry on an economic level is a formidable task. Now let's delve into the emergence and global recognition of the extended proboscis, a distinctive feature of Georgian bees. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, a period marked by the advancement of animal husbandry in European countries and Russia, a scientist took 40 families of our bees to the Orlov region. Here, the bees with longer proboscises proved immensely beneficial. The context involves the cultivation of red clover in virgin soil. In the virgin soil, an insect known as the wasp played a crucial role as a pollinator. However, a significant shift occurred when the red clover seeds were sown in this fertile ground. Contrary to expectations, the yield was considerably lower than anticipated, failing to meet the requirements of the animal husbandry. This perplexed the community, prompting questions about the cause of such diminished productivity. After all, the red clover was intentionally planted to facilitate honey production, participate in pollination, and provide a green mass for animal husbandry. A group of scientists from America and various European countries initiated a comprehensive study measuring the proboscis of bees on different continents. They observed a drastic decline in wasp populations, attributing it to the exploitation of virgin lands. The disappearance of wasps created the need of alternative pollinators and bees emerged as the primary candidates. However, the researchers noticed a significant challenge. The bees had shorter proboscises. This limitation hindered their ability to reach the base of red clover, extract nectar, and effectively pollinate the crops in the process. Therefore, Benton, an American scientist, among others, gradually extended their research and they settled in Gagra, Georgia. Ilarion Kaftaradze, a pioneer in queen bee breeding, was based there. Ilarion Kaftaradze produced the first Georgian queen bees. Benton took five queen bees to America for further examination, conducting microscopic and external assessments, including measurements of the proboscis. They observed that at that time, the length of the proboscis was notably long for the Caucasian Georgian bee. This marked the beginning of the global recognition of the long proboscis feature of the Georgian bee, although it possesses various other positive qualities. The significance of the Georgian bee extends beyond its long proboscis. In my opinion, the most distinctive aspect, the key characteristic of the Georgian bee that garnered acclaim, is in its gentle and meek nature. Georgian bee is known for being both clever and docile. Now let's explain what protocols we might follow while engaging in beekeeping activities. First, remember to overcome the fear. The way you behave on the first day will shape your habits throughout. Remember not to approach the beehive early in the morning or during windy and rainy weather. Choose appropriate times and the bees will remain calm. The bees are already distressed as they can't go out and now you entering the hive and disturbing them during such times can agitate them. Pause and wait until 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and continue until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This is the serene period. The bees are outside their hive. The nurse bees and worker bees inside are not inclined to disturb you. They are non-aggressive, dedicated to their duties. 
This is the optimal time for undisturbed work. Second, avoid approaching the beehive at night. Bees can't see in the darkness. The common belief that they can see in the dark is not true. A bee has five eyes, yet it mainly relies on its two upper eyes for vision, but the three front eyes below the lower eyes are for detecting ultraviolet rays, imperceptible to us but vital for bees, given their vision and sensitivity surpassing humans 50 to 160 times. Through nervous twitches, the simple eyes would have named alarm clock eyes akin to awakening eyes respond to ultraviolet signals. They sense the dawn and signal the upper intricate eyes responsible for vision to prepare bees for their day. While literature commonly categorizes them as three simple eyes and two intricate eyes, I like to refer to them as alarm clock eyes. So simple aka alarm clock eyes can see they play a crucial role in perceiving ultraviolet rays and sending signals to the intricate aka vision eyes to activate them enabling the bees to venture out and fly. This is precisely why we advise everyone in beekeeping courses to avoid working with bees in the evening or during the night time. Now, why is it discouraged? Because when you engage with the bees during these hours, they will climb on your body. In the absence of ultraviolet rays emitted at night, they lose their ability to see and fly. Then the only way to remove them is by shaking them off manually, causing them to fall onto the grass in this condition, unable to see these bees unfortunately succumb and die. All I've said is proven. Behave appropriately. Avoid self-proclaimed activities. Consult specialists and ask questions. Be meticulous as even minor mistakes with bees can lead to significant damage. Seek guidance. Don't shy away from hard work. You are the longshoreman in your tasks. Learn everything, including jabbing a wire. In my apiary, in my bee garden, I take on the roles of a cleaner, carpenter, and more. No need to bring in extra help, so be ready for anything and handle everything on your own because various tasks, tasks will come your way. Yet the joy of doing it all is so rewarding. It is such a pleasure to observe your own handiwork in the beehives, appreciating how beautifully the honeycombs are arranged and intricately painted. Now when it comes to color, someone asked me which color is better. Of course yellow is better. Why traffic officers wear yellow uniforms? It's visible even in the dark, and don't assume you won't need to visit the apiary bee garden at night, so someone following you can still see where you are even in the dark. Now let's discuss lights and the color of lights. Bees cannot see red light. In my bee garden at night working on bee venom, I use red lights in the hive. Why red light? Well, they don't emit ultraviolet rays. Bees are attracted to ultraviolet rays, much like a bee drawn to a lamp. All of us had a bee enter our home. That's why in the bee garden with a red light on, like photographers use, when I descend at night or handle honeycomb frames, I place them on the hive. Afterward, I leave everything undisturbed and return in, in, in the morning. You should know I'm sharing this for knowledge, not as a directive to go and turn on a red light. Having a red light is important, particularly for someone skilled in bee venom extraction. Bee venom should be extracted in the middle of the night, be wrapped up and packed before dawn. You don't have direct contact with bees and remember, they lack aggression. The main aggression occurs when they pour bee venom on a device installed in the hive. They won't be aggressive towards you, especially if you're properly dressed, preventing any interaction. Now let's discuss the attire. Many outfits are available for proper beekeeping attire. When shopping stores might recommend items with hats and cloth materials, avoid cloth made options. Go for windbreaker jackets used by cyclists. They are Thin and glossy, ensuring bees won't bother you if you're fully covered, even if inside the hive. Focus on top outwear. Not a single bee will bother you as they can't get a grip on the tightly woven fibers. The honey produced by bees is often referred to as the elixir of life due to its rejuvenating effects and health-preserving qualities. Ancient philosophers, including renowned figures like Hippocrates, noted in their memoirs that they lived beyond a hundred years by using bee products.
recognize honey as a product of exceptional nutritional value and healing properties. Beekeeping goes beyond honey. Advancements like microscopes and royal jelly, aka bee milk, have been introduced, though royal jelly has long been known. Its collection began in 1960. This remarkable substance, rich in nutrients, is a potent energy source and a resistance booster for the human body. It has benefits for lactating women and can aid in fertility. The products from beekeeping are health-promoting and can contribute to the healing process for various diseases. The primary goal of processing for bees is to provide their generation with quality products free from impurities. Bees expand a significant amount of energy on this process, impacting their life expectancy. In spring, a bee's life is limited to about a month or a month and a half due to the extensive energy expenditure in these tasks. The queen bee, known for its larger size, a topic for another episode, but anyway, it has a lifespan of four to five years, nourishing itself with royal jelly. Royal jelly contains growth and life-expanding hormones. Utilizing royal jelly to extend human lives and enhance resistance has shown positive effects. In cases where children face growth challenges, royal jelly is sometimes administered to stimulate growth hormones. Nature and bees share a close connection. If this chain breaks, the existence of both is at, is at risk. Bees and nature co-originated predating humans. The notion that anything can replace a bee is a falsehood. Bees play a crucial role in pollination. In certain countries, entities, whether named pollinator companies or officials, rent bee colonies from beekeepers for this purpose. They pay a good amount of money for each colony, creating a win-win scenario. Bees feed on nectarines from the renter's flowers, benefiting both parties. In estimation, bees reward the land a hundred times more for the nectar they consume. Thus, the owner is indifferent to whether someone harvested honey from the hive or collected pollen with royal jelly. The primary concern is the effectiveness of pollination works. This is why many countries prioritize and diligently undertake essential pollination efforts. In different regions, the improper use of poisonous chemicals has significantly diminished bee populations, reaching critical levels and leading to widespread disappearance. The misuse of these pesticides has not only harmed the entomological fauna, but also disrupted the delicate balance of local, local ecosystems. Every substance comes with specific usage guidelines, and when followed correctly, adverse effects can be avoided. However, our tendency to rush and disregard precise measurements has led to the destruction of local entomological fauna. It's essential for us, especially as beekeepers, to learn from these mistakes and ensure that such actions are not repeated, preventing further negative consequences. Man's pollination remains the fundamental duty for bees, since their origin. However, once humans discovered honey in the hive, their desire to extract honey led to further interventions, leading to a cascade of actions and consequences. The history of beekeeping development involves the initial stage of hunting and then the era of fixed calm tree hives, which spanned several centuries. What does that mean? So back in the early days of beekeeping, people started by hunting bees, not the friendliest approach I know. But then they had this light bulb moment. Instead of wiping out the whole bee gang, they marked specific trees as their own, where bees built their hives with fixed combs. Each family in the village had its own designated tree. It was like, this is my tree, that's your tree. They would climb up their marked trees to snack some honey without hurting the bees. It was kind of like a sustainable honey extraction club. After that, many decades and perhaps even a hundred years passed and people began using troughs. These troughs were as long as a tree log and bees lived in them, trough hives. You can still find them in Abkhazia and there are many in Mereti too. In places near forests, bees live in these trough hives. There are also aka bee hunters when a swarm of bees settles in a fixed calm tree hive. The hunter goes to get it, 
They know how to climb a tree, cut the fixed comp tree hive, sew it, bring it, and set it up in their own bee box. This is called the fixed comp tree hive. Then came the idea of owning bees privately. Instead of destroying them, people thought it's better to have them as private property. Later in 1814, Prokopovich invented framed hives. And along with that, the deadened bee suit and deadened blood bee hive were created. This marked the gradual improvement and refinement of the beekeeping industry. Today, we have modern bee colonies with all these innovations and we take good care of them. This means we don't harm the frames and we don't harm the bees. Most of the time, humans tend to mess things up when it comes to nature. When bees were in fixed comb tree hives on trees and humans didn't interfere, the bees thrived perfectly, perfectly on their own. But as soon as humans started cutting those hives, disturbing the bees' peaceful life, things changed. Now, as we moved them into our cultural modern hives, it's our job, it's our liability to keep them calm and understand their intelligence. We can't outsmart bees or force them to behave as we want. We have to adapt to their intelligence, not the other way around. Certainly, we've encountered some deviations. Artificial honeycombs were introduced to encourage bees to construct all-purpose cells as a foundation. If left to their own devices, bees naturally build cells primarily for meals. Why is that? Because humans have created a shortage of them. Restrictions imposed by humans no longer permit bees to construct cells for meals, leading to this shortage. If bees find any free space, any free corner, they will create male cells everywhere because of the shortage. Of course, we don't desire an excessive number of male bees, but that doesn't mean that should that there shouldn't be any male bees at all. In nature, families have both male and female co components, similar to mathematical pluses and minuses, and male and female members contribute to the balance. However, with bees, the situation is a bit different. Male bees are eliminated by the worker bees. They are expelled from the hive. Male bees, also known as drones, consume five to six times more than worker bees and don't contribute to the hive's activities. Their sole purpose is to fertilize newly hatched queen bees. If no new queen emerges, male bees are retained until the colony intends to reproduce, and then they are cast out when their role is no longer needed. So it was the first lecture providing an introduction to the world of bees. As we conclude this inaugural episode on the fascinating world of beekeeping, I hope you've gained at least a bit of insight into the importance of bees and the unique contributions of the Georgian bee. We've just scratched the surface and there is a lot more beautiful information coming your way in the next lectures. As I noted before, please keep in mind that English is not my first language, so if you have any suggestions or corrections regarding bee biology or apicultural terms, feel free to share them in the comments. Until next time, happy beekeeping and may the hum of bees continue to echo in the gardens of curiosity.